Please welcome to the stage the CEO of Farm Africa, Nicolas Mounard, along with Joanne Rocca, Gagan Anand, and Aneka Acha. My name is Nicolas Mounard. Uh, I'm the chief exec of, uh, of Farm Africa, as, uh, as Will said. We're basically an, an NGO working on, a, on agricultural and environmental development in, in East Africa. We work with approximately 2.5, 2.6 million farmers uh, across four countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, and, uh, and Uganda. And we implement programs for the lack of the, of the UN or the World Food Program or the, uh, the Gates Foundation. Uh, I'm not used to being in, in such a glamorous uh, environment. I spend a lot of my time in, uh, in, in Africa. Uh, but I'm lucky enough to, uh, to lead that NGO, who is basically the, uh, the partner of Well 50 Best. So I was in Melbourne last year and, uh, and had the chance to, uh, to, to, to meet with, uh, with Johan. And what, what struck me when we, when we started to talk was how radically different our uh, respective worlds were. Um, in terms of geography, of course, you know, nothing in common between uh, Catalonia and, and Ethiopia. But so different in terms of the people we work with and the people we work for. Uh, so different uh, in terms of diet, in terms of nutrition, and um, typically you'll, you'll, you'll hear from Dan Barber uh, lately about some of the great stuff they're doing uh, in agriculture in, uh, in stone barns, but those are the kind of things that we can't do in Africa. There is also a radical uh, different agricultural uh, model. But the more we talked, uh, the more I, I became aware of um, the common ground between us, and uh, we're, we're both working on food, we're both working on product, and the, the farmer I work with, they grow maize, they grow coffee, they grow tomato, they grow beans. Uh, but I think there is a, a common ambition to, to go beyond the product, to go beyond food, uh, in order to, to transform lives, basically. Um, and for me, what, what makes the link between kind of food and the people is, is agriculture. And you know, the beautiful things about talking of agriculture or talking of farming is when you, when you talk about farming, you talk about food, but you also talk about nutrition, you talk about gender equality, you talk about climate change, you talk about environment, you talk about soil fertility. Um, so, you know, agriculture is, is everything. So based on that common ground, we've, we've decided to, to launch that movement called uh, Chef for Change, where we're basically trying to reconcile the world of high-end cuisine <coughs> and the world of uh, uh, the most remote rural community in, uh, in Africa, <coughs> Latin America, and Asia. Uh, by basically pairing chefs with uh, programs uh, in this country. Um, so basically what the three of, uh, of uh, the best chefs of the world are going to do today is take three of their dish uh, and tell you how much their dish are um, carrying in terms of human footprint, how much people are uh, behind the food, and uh, what made them made the choice of, uh, of uh, supporting Chef for Change. So a big round of applause for, uh, for Johan Roca. Okay. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning to everybody. First of all, I apologize for my, my English. I am currently learning. But I try to uh, say a few words in English for you today. I will do my best. <laughs> we have been taking part uh, in UN programs and collaborating to raise awareness of Air, air disease, sustainable development goals, as one of their ambassadors. Now, <clears throat> we started a project in Nigeria with farmers and chefs. The name is Food Africa. Kaduna is a region that suffers from hunger issues. When the surplus of tomato crops is wasted, it's terrible. When there is no culture of preservation techniques, life is wasted. But we can share this knowledge with them. Life can be preserved. We have a lot of knowledge about preservation techniques in the Mediterranean area. And this is what we are doing in Africa now. This tomato are their life jacket. 
to social development, face poverty, face hunger and its consequences, and economic growth. So, this tomato has become a symbol. It means more than a simple tomato. It's necessary that we do our bit to help. We can also raise awareness here in our restaurant. Landscape and nature have always been one of our creative inspiration sources. Our cuisine aims to embrace our natural heritage with respect. Now, Now, <clears throat> I would like to share with you an example, a short video of a dish that involves people from different fields. We work with scientists, farmers, shippers, artisans that upcycle used materials like wine bottles to keep our coming men with SDGs in our restaurant. We can believe, we believe we can cook the world we want. Cook the world you want. And enjoy the video. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. When, when, when we first started the conversation, I, I asked Johan, you know, which dish really represents your, your commitment? And, and, and they picked the calzotada, which also, I think, has a huge history of, you know, terroir yes. and region yes. and tradition. Yes. 
Yeah. And uh, we were having that discussion about, again, the, the common ingredients in our, in our jobs. And I think one of the common ingredients is that kind of balance between modernity, innovation, and tradition, tradition yes. um, which is also something we're facing when we try to change things on the ground. We, you know, we need to embrace tradition, but we need to break it and we need to, to change it. We need to grow from tradition uh, in the same way that you're, you're doing in, uh, with the Calcitano. Okay. To shift to, uh, to, to Ineco, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I visited you, I think just after having visited Johan, and uh, I saw the same um, willingness of being rooted in region uh, a same willingness of rooting the restaurant in a community. Um, so please welcome in Eko Acha. Euno, buenos dias. Good morning to everybody. Uh, apologize also for my English. I will try to <laughs> translate my ideas and my passion about the, the next uh, history that uh, I want to, to show you. Uh, I think that uh, gastronomy is a universal language that speaks about, uh, about us. Uh, but in this case, I consider it myself like a person and after chef. And like a chef, uh, our uh, uh, day job is to uh, cook for the, for, for the guest. But also, on the other side, we are uh, cooking other things in other kitchen. We are cooking one uh, better future. Because I think that uh, our knowledge uh, have to be to use also for the society because we are receiving a lot of things for the society, for the landscape, and we have to uh, also uh, give to the nature and for the society something about our knowledge. For today, we can speak uh, about uh, different projects that we are uh, doing, about the sustainability, about the health, about the, our comp social compromise, but we want to explain something to we are trying to work in the our uh, landscape with our farmers with very very simple example please let me uh, ri uh, write uh, my notes to explain better uh, how is the uh, a small example to understand how the important is that we are uh, cooking every day in the, this example you can uh, see one green tea pierce Purple onion gel from Saya. Saya is a small country in the Biscaya, and comprend from Mungia. But what is behind these uh, ingredients? We find people committed to environment and the land, such as uh, Guillermo Delgado, Ana Maria Yaguno, and Luisa Cillona. These are some important local producers who are the ones interpreting nature for us. But uh, how do we promote their work and how does the recipes influence? The work we do with them has different connotation for both for us. For example, in different ingredients that we can uh, show you in, in the script, the tea pears is the, the, the most important ingredient in the, in the recipe. Uh, Guillermo is a small producer who lives uh, with fear and recklessness because although that hard work ever, never knows if he will be able to shell the harvest. We offer the guarantee and security they need, compromising that everything they show, we will buy it. We always, every day, when we spoke with uh, the farmers, all the farmers have a doubt with the nature, with the, with the schedules, and also, thinking how many put uh, I have to collect in the land because in the end I don't know if I can shell everything. And then we have an incredible or, or big compromise with our uh, farmers to buy all, the re all that collected. Then we are thinking and contributing also for the tranquility of the, of the farmers. On the other side, we can uh, find other uh, ingredient in this uh, recipe is uh, cebolla morada de saya, red onion from saya. And in this case, our uh, first uh, idea was that uh, collaborate with Anamari Yaguno, is our farmer, and with Anamari, recover one uh, uh, product that was uh, a point of disappear, is the cebolla morada de saya. But in the end, and maybe the inconscient why, we understand that we don't recover only the, 
the product. When we promote that this product, when we promote in different magazines, in different recipes, with the other college, uh, other chef net, this product, we push all the time this product, but push all the time something more important than the product for me is the community of the women that are working about this project now. Behind this project, in four or five years ago, Anna Marie was the unique uh, woman working about this product, and now we can say that uh, more or less five, six, seven uh, women are working in this. Then we recover using this product the community of the women that work with this product. And in the end, then we are recovering on one side, uh, the guarantee of uh, buy all the products, and then the, it's more sustainable for the farmers. On the other hand, the community of the women. And in the end, we, we feel that uh, a very romantic uh, jobs are a point of disappear. And uh, because normally, when we are speaking about the roman romantic things, it's romantic, but uh, sometimes it's very difficult for the people. And for the new generation, no, it's interesting to work in different things. And then, in the recipe, you can find uh, different crunchy breads. Different, this crunchy bread is uh, making with uh, uh, um, corn from uh, Mungia. It's a very traditional uh, product from here, but it's a point of disappear also. But something more uh, worse is that the, no, is the unique thing that is a point of disappear. If not the meals, when the uh, producer this uh, bread, is also a point of disappear. Then our strategy was to speak with uh, Luisa Cillona, the, the corn uh, producer, and I spoke with, uh, with Luis and said, OK, Luis, we can support you. We can buy uh, your, uh, your fantastic product. But uh, what do you think if we start to um, creating one tour with different journalists, with different uh, foodies, with different people to come to your farmer and observe, and you can translate your magic history about this. And we started to go with the different uh, friends, with different uh, uh, chefs, with all the people, and in the end, we started also to go with the new generation of the, of the Basque country, but not only chefs, for the other disciplines also. And now we are feeling that some, pe some young people are understanding that uh, some jobs like uh, Luis Asillona uh, can be or could be very interesting to recover and to uh, start to work in different uh, small projects. Today we uh, are uh, uh, more or less one community with uh, 32 uh, small farmers and more or less the 40% of the farmers are young people. The 40% 40, the 40 of the farmers are, are young people, but they are half and a half men and women. Then, it's a simple example, it's a simple dish, but we are feeling all the time that behind the stands, like in cinema, behind the cook, behind the dishes, we can find incredible stories. And we have the responsibility to push these stories. And this is a, a small example that we want to translate and we are, uh, I start to speaking that we have two kitchens. One kitchen is that day, day by day that we have to offer our guests. But we have other kitchen that we have to translate and we have to work every day with responsibility about the society, about the landscape, about the farmers, about the fishermen, about the health, about the society, because it's our compromise. Thank you very much. And, and, and again, when we, when, when we talk uh, in ECHO, I think there was a lot of the ingredients of your, of your sustainability policy sounded really familiar to me. So a lot of what we're doing is about structuring the, uh, the, uh, the farmers into a cooperative around giving them access to, 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 to the market. And also, things that resonate for me is the, all the things that you're doing to, um, with, with female farmers, with women in particular, which are a big, big topic for, for us in, in agriculture in, in, in Africa. Um, the next uh, chef brings, I think, something completely different. Uh, both Johan and Eko are very rooted in the region. What I love about uh, Gagan is the fact that he, he, he unrooted himself uh, to root it somewhere else. Uh, I feel actually quite sympathetic with that, being French in London. 
uh, and um, <laughs> and I and I and I love that because that's also what we're going to try to do with these guys of unrooting them from their community, from their neighborhood, to root them in programs uh, in the developing world. So uh, please give a big round of applause to Gagan. <laughs> The video is last, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good evening or good afternoon, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you a story. I was born in India in a city called Calcutta, British India. I studied in a school which is called St. Thomas Boys School and is the second English school in India and also the second English school in Asia. The school was built in 1789, and in that school, the Britishers made it for the British then working in Calcutta, and later on, we took over, and it became a convent school in India. So, with my very bad musical talents, I was supposed to be in a choir. And in the choir, in every morning in that school, because the school was 200 years old, but they were still following the prayer every morning, saying, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, like the Iron Maiden song, you know? Yeah, and yeah. And give us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread. And this was at 7.55 in the morning, and five minutes after, exactly at 8 a.m., we had breakfast but our breakfast was rice. And five minutes back, we asked the God, like, give us bread, and we're getting rice. I mean, there was something wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was something unplanned or not Google translated for India enough. <laughs> 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 I, I didn't knew that, I mean, it was just rice. And, and rice uh, is probably the first thing I ate when I was after my mother's milk. And, uh, I was talking to Nico, and uh, one told me to be part of this project, and I was feeling, wow, one thinks about me. It's amazing. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, and then I said, like, uh, the problem is sustainability, as I said before also. In first world countries, and sustainability in Asia, where we are developing from a third world to try to pretend as first world, is a completely different agenda. Rice feeds three and a half billion people. And rice could be $20 a kilo, or could be five kilos for a dollar. Rice would be at the poorest home in the world, and still be at the most richest man in the world's home. Rice starts a day in Asia, and India divides the world into two halves. I'll tell you how. If you go South India, and you go East India, and you go more east and south, the whole world is rice. You go west, and you go north, up to America, everything is bread. Rice is our daily bread. And then, we're talking to Nico, and Nico said rice is, yes, in Africa, and we were discussing this, and Africa actually is the fastest growing nation which is switching to rice as the staple. And then I thought, how could I help? I, but then there's something common, because I lived 20, 29 years in India, 11 years in Bangkok, and in two years I'm moving to Japan. And the three most common things in this part of the world is rice. And the three rices are completely different. I mean, if you compare Indian long grain rice compared to Thai rice or jasmine rice and to Japanese rice, they're th three different stories. Let me tell you a funny story, because I'm supposed to be one who entertains you, right? Yeah, you're here for entertainment, right? You want to laugh and smile, right? So I'll tell you a story. I have time, right? All the time you need. <laughs> <laughs> so this rice, a friend of mine who is one of the biggest rice growers in India, and I was, and his bag of rice, he said like, he washes the rice in Ganges River from the mountains, and. So I really was so interested, and I met the owner, and he was very really interested, all this very commercial. By the way, every rice packet that we buy is a commercial rice, right? We can't buy artisan rice. It doesn't exist, because all these guys, they buy all the rice from the small farmers. 
So I said I was looking for this old basmati because my friend said that nine-year-old rice in Italy is the most important rice and aging rice helps. So I said, okay, give me a nine-year-old rice. He said, we don't age Indian rice. Then he said, yeah, yeah, we have something which is like six-year-old. I said, okay, let me try that. So he gave me a bag of five kilos of that rice. I hand carried it from India, bought it and kept it in my home. And the following week I had to travel. And if you see old rice, they have insects in it. And that's a good sign. And uh, so my mother-in-law opened the bag and she's Thai and she has no idea about Indian rice. And she saw the insects in it, dead ones. So what she said was, when I, about four days back, after I came back, I saw my dogs were eating those rice because my, my mother-in-law thought that rice was not good enough. She, she threw it to the dogs. And I was so angry because it was only 20 kilos of rice which was existing and I got five of it and two kilos were already eaten by my dogs, my lucky dogs. <laughs> yeah. And then from there on, if you look at rice and how it is, when I arrived in Thailand, and everybody in Thailand, if you go to Thailand, how they respect the king, late king, and, and he taught Thais something very interesting. It was about, this is the fields, grow your rice, and this is our water, feed the fishes. And fish and rice will never leave you hungry. It was so important. And in Asia, if you are an Asian, you know this, what I'm talking about. Fish and rice is so important. From Japan, to the most expensive sushi that you pay for, to the poorest of the people on the street who would eat a leftover fish or a fish skin or, or something out of that and boil rice or congees in China or to rice being cooked together with fish as curry is so important, so in, integral to Asia. And then I started working with historians and then I realized what was the biggest step towards being human? We were apes, right? You and us, we were apes, planet of apes. And suddenly we became humans. Some of you were like orangutan and some of you were like chimpanzee like me, but we were apes, right? <laughs> we evolved. And rice evolved also with us because rice is, if you trace back, it's traced to China and it's 7,000 BC, right? That's the first rice that we consider. But is that the rice we eat today? So I was very interested in history and how we evolved, the two basic steps towards what we are as humans today was rice and fire. Fire made us human. The first cooked dish must have been a barbecue, and there's no doubt about this. A barbecue is an element where food becomes edible, and we as humans can eat it in a more relaxed way, whereas animals, they fight for food, right? From a piranha to a monkey. They fight for food. We, as humans, we eat. Our muscles relax. Can you eat raw rice? You can't. You need to cook the rice enough so that you don't have to chew it. You have to enjoy it. And fire is so important because fire cooks rice. It cooks things to be more edible. And the most prehistoric recipes are something being cooked alive in a jungle and burnt out and and something being cooked. And the f then I went back to India and our history, because we are such a old civilization. And in India, most of the places, rice was cooked and served in banana leaves. Because this was the first utensil before anything else was used in my part of the world. And still, in the most auspicious Indian weddings, in the most traditional weddings, banana leaves is where we serve the rice and then things go in a very, very uh, clockwise way. They and you eat with hands. So I realized that when I traveled and I went to Mexico and I went to Latin America, to uh, Amazonia, and again in, in, in Japan, in Asia and other places, there was a heavy reference of things being cooked in wood and leaves and something being cooked inside the leaf, like the tamale and all the things that you know about, about or the lotus leaves. So that's how my recipe started. So my recipe is about wood, banana leaf, 
and about rice and fish. And uh, I have a very stupid video which I'm selling to MTV after this show. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's a new video, it's a new remix, so enjoy the video. First, when I was in Bangkok, I, I advocated for Credence Clearwater more than Billy Joel, but you, you opted for yeah. Billy Joel. <laughs> Actually, when I first met Nico, I said, uh, okay, let's do this. So I called the most, uh, he's one of the most famous filmmaker in art movies in India, and I said, let's create this movie, and, and he charges a lot. And I said, we're doing this for Farm Africa, so can we do it for free? And he said, yes. <laughs> Sometimes emotion sells, and uh, we were talking about how rice, and how important rice is, and how rice could be a disaster and yet could be the most wonderful thing in your mouth, so. And to, for, for the two ingredients that Gagan chose, I mean, on the rice side, uh, what I found really interesting is like, you had the whole theory that the world is divided between wheat and, and rice, and people don't usually know that, but Africa is definitely on the, on the, uh, on the rice side of the world. Uh, so when we were trying to make bridges between Africa and, and, and your history, um, uh, rice became quite obvious. And fire was also fascinating for us because like, you can get the best out of fire and you can get the worst out of fire. In, in Africa, you can use fire to slash and burn, basically clear, clear the land, and, and it's, it's an absolute disaster. But it's also fire that roast coffee. It's fire that roast cocoa. So it's fire that transform kind of very raw ingredients in something quite amazing. So in a nutshell, you know, we are launching that initiative. Uh, it, it's called Chef for Change. It's basically uh, 25 programs uh, it covered 12 countries. Uh, we're going to pair 50 chefs and unroot them and bring them in Africa, bring them in Latin America, and bring them in Asia. And the beauty of agriculture, as I was saying in the introduction, is like the, if you take the sustainable development goals of the UN, you can address the 17 goals through agriculture. Um, but just to finish on that, on that, on that one, you know, the, the UN has defined uh, the, the SDG back in 2015 to basically sort out poverty by 2030. Um, there was a, a research that was published last week saying that actually we're really late and like we would need 85 years to achieve what the SDG uh, uh, are, are saying we should. So we need to step up our game. So, you know, we need these guys to shed the light on the big challenge. So spread the world, uh, chef for change, it's tough now and uh, these guys will travel uh, around the world. So thanks very much. Hugh.